Thank you very much. I want to stretch your imagination today and get you thinking about food and innovation in a way that we don't often think about it. I'm a journalist, mostly. That's what I do. I write about food and agriculture. And I write a lot about social movements, what's happening at the grassroots and at the community level. And for my last book that was titled Consumed, I traveled around the world to report on how people in different countries are changing the way food is grown, how they're changing the way it is sold, and how it is marketed. And what I found was a global social movement that is coming up with all sorts of innovative solutions to the really big social issues of our time, namely climate change and environmental degradation, and also to the big questions of how do we feed this world's growing population? Their solutions also speak to these shifting consumer values that we've just heard about um, when it comes to food and, and a rise in, in environmental awareness in the general public. So this global social movement is addressing the same issues that many of these big industries and in, uh, big players in the food industry are grappling with, from agribusiness all the way right down to the, to the farmer in the field. But the difference is that they're innovating with a lot less capital, and their solutions are almost entirely about good ideas rather than capital investments. So this global social movement, and I like to call it the global sustainable food movement, it's a source of so much innovation that often is overlooked and ignored and largely unrecognized. So I thought I'd like to shine the light on, on this innovations today. So let's start by defining innovation. Strange question at an innovation co at conference, but what is innovation? Because a lot of the time we equate innovation with R&D, research and development. Well, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, it defines innovation as more than R&D, a lot more. The OECD defines innovation as a process that involves governments, businesses, and not-for-profits across a variety of sectors. And this definition of innovation that involves so many different players in different sectors speaks to how good ideas are being generated and put into play by exactly this global social movement. So solutions from the global sustainable food movement typically involve governments, small businesses, nonprofit organizations. It's a collaboration. The OECD lists four types of innovation. That's product innovation. So product innovation is a good or a product that is, in, that is su substantially improved or that's completely new. There's process innovation, which is a new or significantly improved way of delivering or producing the product, marketing innovation, and then the fourth innovation is organizational. So the, uh, the change in a way an organization it, it works, it's business practices. And I'm gonna touch on all these types of innovations today and tell you about how food producers in Canada that are part of this global social movement and others around the world are creating new products that they're marketing in new ways and that they're delivering in new ways and then the way they're, that they're reorganizing to, to facilitate this innovation. And I'm also going to talk a bit about why it's imperative for all food producers to consider this big picture that is motivating the global sustainable food movement to innovate themselves. And then I'm also going to tell you about some of their innovations that are allowing farmers in particular to profit while at the same time responding to climate change. So what makes these grassroots solutions of this global sustainable movement so unique? It's because they're fueled by good ideas, more than capital, and so that means their ideas and their experiences can be replicated really easily by other people, and they are being replicated. So let me tell you about Brian Gildvesi. Brian is a third generation farmer in Norfolk County. He's, he's really famous in the part of the world where I come from for his beef. Um, he and his wife Kathy, they raise Texas Longhorn cattle for their meat and they raise them on native prairie grass that grows in the sand plain where they live on Norfolk County in Ontario. Chefs in particular love Brian's beef. Um, Brian is so successful, he teaches about Business, his business practices at the Ivy School of Business at the University of Western Ontario. Brian also has a business degree. There's a word in the sus global sustainable food movement for a farmer like Brian, it's starmer, star farmer. That's because he's so successful. But it wasn't always like this. If we were to travel back in time to the 1990s, the early 90s, you'd find Brian growing tobacco 
acres and acres of tobacco. Brian was raised on a tobacco farm, so was Kathy. And when they were married, they continued to grow what they knew how to grow. And that's because you could provide a really good life for a family growing tobacco. There was a supply management quota system. Uh, you, could, you could raise your kids, send them to university, and then retire growing this crop. But we all know what happened to tobacco. Things started to go downhill in the 1980s when the cigarette companies could buy this commodity on the global market at a lot less from countries like Zimbabwe and Brazil. So the price that Brian was paid was undercut on the global marketplace. And then there were those anti-smoking campaigns that made Brian think that maybe there wasn't a future in tobacco for him. So in 1993, Kathy and Brian, they bought two Texas Longhorn mother cows. And these are these big, beautiful animals. They have these giant curling horns like this. They look like they've stepped right out of a Western movie. It turns out that Brian and Kathy were really good at raising cows. They had an eye for cattle. They renamed their farm YU Ranch, and they became beef farmers. Today, Brian and Kathy operate a grass-fed beef operation that has been fueled entirely by innovation. They rejected the conventional way of raising cattle, and so by conventional, I mean uh, feeding your cows corn and sticking a hormone implant in their ear. Instead, Brian and Kathy have gone hormone-free. Instead of, of corn, they feed their cows grass, and they have sowed their, fi their fields with tall grass prairie. So this is a polyculture blend of three grasses and nine different flowers, and these are all species that are indigenous to the area. The cows can graze on the, the fields in the summer when they get really hot. And Brian hays his fields and continues to feed them grass, hay, in the winter. Innovation. Corn has to be planted every year, but Brian only needs to seed his fields one time because they are a perennial crop. So this is a, a major innovation for his business. Um, what he plants is also very hardy. Brian calls them perfectly engineered by nature for climate change. The grasses and flowers in his fields, they don't need any fertilizer other than the, uh, the fertilizer that the cows distribute on their own as they graze, their manure, of course. Um, and the plants do their part in sinking the carbon. Um, they sequester carbon and they keep the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And they even thrive in the heat because their roots go down five meters. So Brian never, ever has to buy feed for his cows, even in a drought. And I, I went, I've visited the farm. I was standing with Brian looking at his fields in the late summer when he was showing me around his farm and he said to me, you know, I've canceled my crop insurance. I don't need it anymore. So talk about building an innovative and resilient business. And there's more. Brian and Kathy have also rejected the conventional way of, of well, that cattle farmers sell their cows. So he doesn't sell them at auction. My parents have cows. They sell them at, they sell them at auction and those calves are shipped to a feedlot um, probably in Alberta, and then slaughtered, but not Brian's. Brian keeps control of his product. He adds value to it by butchering it. He sells it directly to the consumer in several cities in southern Ontario. So he's rethought the way to sell and market meat, and he's been extremely successful. Uh, demand for his product was so high recently that he was starting to butcher his cows early before they reached market weight. But then he realized he'd just have to make the consumer wait for his, for his meat. That's how successful his business has become. And what makes Brian even more remarkable is that he's turned his tobacco fields into a conservation project. So he's gone from tobacco farm to conservation project. He's engaging directly with climate change. Not only does he grow this tall grass prairie to feed his cows, but he's planted trees on his property. He has protected the forest and the hedgerows. Why are hedgerows important? They act as pollinator habitat, habitat that we, well, pollinators we need to grow our food to. Um, he's helping to pr protect species that are endangered in the region, like the American chestnut and the bobolink. The bobolink is a bird that's endangered by conventional haying practices. Um, and Brian is one of the, the leaders in this bobolink conservation practice. So, so Brian has built a thriving business that is producing, marketing, and distributing food in a new way and one that's also founded on environmental principles. So in this way, he's figured out how to do, uh, be a farmer and do something positive about climate change and the environment and environmental degradation and make money to boot. We learn from Brian's story because his success can demonstrate how a good idea and innovation can transform a 
tobacco farm that really was a losing proposition into a prosperous and environmentally conscious cattle ranch without a lot of investment. So Brian shows us how innovation can help food businesses find an opportunity in a problem. And this is really important because we have a big problem in our food system today. The scientific consensus is that climate change is having a profound impact on planet Earth, on, on our biosphere. When the Intergovernmental Planet Panel on Climate Change released its report last spring, the news was dire. I, I'm gonna quote from the Guardian newspaper. Uh, they wrote, think the new climate report is scary? The food apocalypse is already upon us. And, and then it summed up the report in, uh, in this dramatic language. Riots, towns gone dry, soaring prices, crushing starvation. If this sounds like fear-mongering from scientists, talk to the farmers. What the new report from this global scientific body said that, that caused these journalists to invent the term food apocalypse was that their pronouncement that a two degree rise in temperature would do for harm to farming a lot sooner than we'd expected within the next 20 to 30 years. The potential for real damage exists because the way we grow our food now in this industrial food system is not suited to this new climate. To give you a sense of how ill-prepared our farming systems are for climate change, I'll tell you a story that I, I open my book with. It's, it's a story of a USDA scientist, Dr. Louis Ziska. And his, his work looks at how plants respond to higher temperatures and higher levels of CO2 that we're seeing with climate change. Dr. Ziska figured out that at the Baltimore waterfront, the conditions are pretty consistent with what scientists expect it to be on Earth within a few generations. So at the Baltimore waterfront, where Dr. Ziska set up his study plot, it's hot. And there's a lot of carbon dioxide. So when the scientists studied this plot, they found that in these conditions, in, the, in this heat, with a high CO2, it's the weeds that fare the best. So the lamb quarters, one example, in his test plot, grew to be two times the size that they grow to on a farm in the country. So if anyone's a gardener, imagine three meter tall lamb's quarter plants. That's tall. Those are big. Um, I write more about this study in, in detail in, in the book, but, but to summarize, what Dr. Ziska of the USDA concluded was that in the conditions that are expected to be the norm here on Earth, thanks to climate change, it's not the food crops that are going to thrive in the heat and in the CO2. Rather, it's the weeds that are the winners. So what we can take away from this study is that weeds are going to be a huge problem for farmers as the climate changes, and they already are. Farmers use herbicides today to kill weeds because, uh, well, because it works, but, but they grow. Um, but the science shows us that car as carbon dioxide levels increase, as they are with climate change, the chemicals are no longer as effective. So that means you have to pull those weeds by hand. When I asked Dr. Ziska to tell me, like, what can we take away from this study? He said, his results show us that modern agriculture is not suited to a rapidly changing climate. To quote Dr. Louis Ziska of the USDA, when I, when I asked him this, he, he said, very eloquently, he said, I said, he, I asked him whether modern agriculture was good, he said, not so much. That's, that's, that's Louis Ziska that I'm quoting. So climate change is the game changer for modern agriculture. For Brian in 1993, the game changer was that tobacco was causing cancer. And besides, selling his crop on the global marketplace wasn't working. Finding out that the way we farm isn't suited for the future conditions here on Earth is kind of like finding out that the tobacco people are smoking causes cancer. This is something we all have to reckon with. And consumers are increasingly aware of the environmental cost of our food system. Uh, many big food businesses are evidently paying attention to the shift in consumer awareness. For example, McDonald's announced in April that it's creating a supply chain sustainability plan to limit its damage the products cause. Um, they also pledged to soon sell chicken raised without antibiotics. Yum Brands, the, the company that owns KFC and Taco Bell, among others, they said they're going to start sourcing sustainable palm oil. So these are just some of the many examples of big food corporations that are starting to demonstrate some kind of environmental awareness. And I would argue that not only are these companies responding to consumer awareness, but it, you can track these changes in the food sector right back to the global sustainable food movement. Because of this social movement, is, this social movement is changing attitudes of consumers and it's changing expectations and values. And their innovations at the grassroots are trickling out. 
So hopefully these innovations will also trickle up in a meaningful way so that we can have a more sustainable food system. And let's take a step back though. What is a sustainable food system anyway? What is this goal that Brian and the millions of other people around the world who are part of this global sustainable food movement, what are they working towards? Well, very simply, a sustainable food system is a food system that can feed us today, but that can also feed our grandchildren and their grandchildren. So it's a food system that doesn't use too much water, that doesn't use too many fossil fuels, that takes care of biodiversity, the soil, the pollinators. It's a food system that looks a lot different from the status quo. In my book, Consumed, I focus on three themes, three themes that are central to building a sustainable food system. And these are the themes that the global sustainable food movement is organizing around. And so their innovations will typically address one or more of these themes. So first, sustainable agriculture. To have sustainable food systems, we need to get our food system off fossil fuels. So we need to recalibrate. We need to stop using so many resources, so much water, so many toxic chemicals to grow our food. Second is biodiversity. We need to preserve the biodiversity here on Earth so that agriculture can be resilient. Third, culture. We need the kind of culture that supports the first two themes, so sustainable agriculture and biodiversity. This is about changing consumer attitudes and values. And all of these themes come together to inform the innovative solutions of the sustainable food movement. And I could stand here all day and tell you of, of the examples that I've reported on from around the world, but instead I'm gonna give you three thumbnail sketches of innovative food systems that have, that, that have had great success. So to report for my book, I traveled to a farming region of India where the land is very arid and the people are very poor. And the farmers there struggle to grow mostly cotton for the cotton mills, but they really struggle. Uh, the money they earn growing the cotton isn't enough to pay their costs, like seeds and fertilizer and pesticides, uh, the, the, the cost that they need to grow the cotton in, in what they know as the modern way. So these farmers live in destitution. There's a small Indian NGO that wanted to help the farmers in this area, specifically the women, lift them out of poverty. And again, I write, I write extensively about this in the book, but in brief, the organization taught far more than 1,000 women farmers to grow organically. So that means they don't need to buy any of these inputs, the fertilizers and the pesticides that were putting them in debt in the first place. Um, the organization taught them to be self-reliant, to save their seeds, to make their own fertilizers and pesticides out of natural products like the, the neem tree. Um, and they, then they opened what they call an organic bazaar where the women sell, not through a typical middleman like they would have done before who takes a large cut, but rather directly to consumers, like a farmer's market here. And I witnessed just how much their innovative approach in farming and their innovations in marketing had boosted the local economy and created thousands of, of these micro food businesses. And not to mention helping those, those thousands of, of families these prosper. So this innovation in product, organic food, process, marketing, organization, the, the, the women farmers work together in, in this, in, this um, in a cooperative, so, so it's an innovation and organization as well to share business responsibilities. Next sketch, in Montreal, well, like everywhere else in Canada, um, there's a growing market for local and sustainable foods. So a man named Mohammed Hogg founded a company called Lufa Farms in 2011, and he built the world's largest commercial greenhouse on, top, on, on a roof, on top of an industrial building. Um, it's a really big building. It's 31,000 square feet. Uh, inside they grow all sorts of vegetables like tomatoes and greens, peppers and cucumbers, and they focus on making it as sustainable as possible. It's a hydroponic growing system, so they capture rainwater, they have it, it's closed loop, so they circulate um, their, well, their irrigation water and their nutrients, and, and this means everything cycles and, and they don't use uh, synthetic pesticides or, or fertilizers. So number one in, in innovation, they have rethought the traditional farm by putting it on a roof of an industrial building in the city. Uh, number two innovation, they're changing the way food is marketed. They do not distribute to a supermarket. Rather, if you wanna buy their food, you have to become a member of Lufa Farms. And so you subscribe every week and you go online and you choose what you want that they grew that week and then it is delivered to your neighborhood. So innovations in product, process, and marketing. Innovative thumbnail sketch number three, 
In Beijing, China, where I also went to report for the book, uh, more and more people are worried about the quality of their food, about food safety. Uh, we only hear a few of the many food safety scandals that, are, that occur in China. So many people there want to buy organic food, but then there's little trust in anything you can buy at the supermarket or at the wet market, the, the traditional markets where, where people go. Uh, when I was there, one person who works in the food industry told me that if it is certified organic in China, she's more suspicious of it. So people there are trying to devise new ways to build trust with the consumer and to distribute the kinds of food that people want to get but they just can't access. The innovations they're coming up with to address these problems are often ideas inspired by what's happening in the West. So a, f the, the, a flow of, of, innovation, of innovative ideas west to east in this case. Uh, one example are the hundreds of new CSA farms that are opening in China. Uh, in Canada, CSA stands for Community Shared Agriculture. These are farms where people pay to become members and then they're guaranteed a portion of the harvest every year. And this builds trust with the consumer because people have the opportunity to go visit the farm, uh, see for themselves how food is produced. And they're typically organic farms, so they're offering a product that people want. Also, recently, organic farmers markets have, have started begin beginning to open, like, sort of like the ones that we know here. So, so this is, again, to satisfy this, this consumer group. These are just some of the examples of grassroots innovation that's happening around the world. And not only is this innovation creating healthy food systems that are more sustainable, food systems that address some of the issues of climate change, um, in part through supporting organic agriculture and changing the way people farm, uh, not only are they satisfying a growing desire for a different kind of food, but they, what they also have in common is that they're very good for the economy. So this, the food systems that these innovative grassroots food businesses are rooted in, um, they boost rural economies. They connect the urban economy with the rural economy. They provide jobs and they nurture small business opportunities. In developing countries, like in the case of India, local food economies are also a vehicle for development. According to the World Bank, GDP growth that comes out of agriculture is two times more effective at reducing poverty than GDP growth from other sectors. And in developed countries like Canada and the United States, these local food economies have a similarly positive economic effect. This is why in 2009, Vermont improved the farm to plate investment program to increase economic development there. The state created a 10 year strategic plan to build a strong local food system. And the goal there is that food will nurture a vibrant state with a healthy economy. There are regions in Quebec that have followed the same economic development strategic strategy. The reason these governments want to nurture investment in food and agriculture to strengthen the economy is because growth in the food economy spills out into other sectors. This is because of the multiplier effect. What's the multiplier effect? The multiplier effect is an increase in spending that causes an increase in income and consumption that is greater than the initial amount spent. So every dollar spent in a local food economy triggers a growth in income and consumption that is bigger than the amount that was originally spent. A group of academics wanted to study this in Maine. They published their results in the Maine Policy Review. And what they found was that for every one dollar that, that Maine's food er, mar makers earned in revenue generated an estimated one dollar and eighty-two cents in statewide economic activity. And for every one person working in the sector, an additional 1.2 jobs were supported. So innovation from the grassroots has not only been important to farmers like Brian and the people behind these various projects, but they're also good for all of us because they help the environment and they help the economy. I wanna finish with a story of innovation from the grassroots that's had profound impact on the economy of a region in France, in the Aubrac. So the Aubrac Mountains are in the south and they are the most gentle of mountains, nothing like you see here. Their tops are rounded and smooth. They're like giant pebbles. And when I was there, the sky was a brilliant blue and those, those rounded fields were green and they're speckled with red, uh, red and, and purple and, and blue of the wildflowers. I met a man there named Monsieur Valadier. He, he's a farmer there. And, and he explained to me that these fields are the foundation for their local food economy of their food system because the grass that grows these fields essentially makes the milk. Grass makes milk, which makes cheese, with the cow as a vehicle, of course. 
And as with all food systems and food economies, there everything depends on nature. So the innovation that has been so successful in the Obrac is recognizing the fact that the food system and the economy is dependent on nature and figuring out how to turn this into an economic advantage. So every spring since the Middle Ages, the farmers in the Obrac, they've accompanied their cattle from their winter dwellings, their barns, and they walk up the mountains with the cows where they spend their summer on the pasture. And that's where they make, well, they used to make the cheese up, up on the mountains in these old stone houses called Buron. Up until about the 1960s, the, the farmers would leave their cattle to graze there, and then the men called Buronniers, they would live in these stone houses and make the cheese. The kind of cheese is called laiole. And this tradition remained strong until the 1960s when industrial methods of production were introduced. The, the farmers were encouraged by government workers and, and scientists, agronomists, to abandon their old ways and to adopt the newer approach to dairy production. So they were encouraged to turn away from their alpine cattle breed and instead raise high-yielding Holsteins. Um, they were encouraged to feed these cows corn and silage, take them off the grass, and they were also encouraged to abandon their old ways of making cheese. Well, lots has happened in the Obrac since then, uh, and I, again, I tell the whole story in the book, but in short, the farmers in the area, they went down the conventional path for a few decades, but they quickly saw that this way of farming would not serve them well. So they, so, so they did a U-turn and they went back to their, their old ways. That was the first step in their innovation. So rather than making a cheese in the industrial way, that is, producing the best possible product at the lowest cost, the cost in this case being the financial tally of, of the various prices of the ingredients and plus labor and equipment, et cetera, you know this. Uh, the farmers in the Aubrac make their cheese in an entirely different paradigm. So the farmers are not, I repeat, not focused on using the least, in, inexpensive, ex, least expensive inputs. Rather, their priorities are a way of life that is in tune with the cycles and the limits of nature. And the consumers, who buy their cheese, choose it because, well, it tastes really good, but also because of what it represents. Because there's an expression in France for this, because of its panier de bien, the values in there. So let me explain. In the Aubrac, the cows that thrive the best in, in the pretty harsh conditions of the mountains, they typically don't produce as much milk as a breed of a cow like a Holstein. But the cows that thrive in the Aubrac are adapted to the climate and the geography of the region. The way they graze on the mountain grasses allows the local biodiversity to flourish there. So these animals, they play a certain role in the landscape, and by making cheese that people sell, they allow people to live in a remote area where they steward this landscape. Monsieur Valadier, he's the starmer of this story. Uh, he's the one who connected the dots and helped everyone understand that the Laiole cheese they make has a value that is more profound than just dollars and cents. Because Inside that cheese, there's a value that you can't see, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, but that value is the environmental value, an idea of sustainability, and that's what people want to pay for, and they do pay for it. Uh, the entire region's economy today depends on this cheese. All the farmers now feed their cows only grass, so there's no more uh, industrial feeding methods allowed. So that's number one, product and in, um, innovation and production. Monsieur Valadier organized the farmers into a cooperative so that they collect, the cooperative collects the milk and, and they make the cheese together. So number two, uh, innovation and organization. And then they market their cheese differently. Uh, they were able to get special certification from the French government, so back to that cross-sectoral collaboration. Uh, French government that indicates to the consumer that this cheese is made in the traditional way. It has a, an AOC certification, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. They also sell their cheese through the cooperative. The success has been so noticeable uh, that when I was visited, I was told young people don't leave the region as much anymore. Um, they have not felt the economic crisis as much as other regions. And they believe that because they've figured out how to produce the, che the cheese as sustainably as possible, this is, this is the reason for their success. And they sell this idea to the consumer who wants to support more sustainable food systems, the consumer who wants to support vibrant rural economies. I understood how profound this was to the community when I was at a public event with Monsieur Valadier, and an elected official called him the Pope of Aligo. 
So this is now for the, the fun part of my talk, because I want to talk just a little bit about food at a food conference, the actual yummy stuff that we eat, because, well, food is culture. Food is more than just a product, right? Food speaks to your heart. It speaks to your family. It speaks to your identity. It speaks to the past. It speaks to the future. Uh, feed brings us together, and it, it brings us so much joy. So aligo is, is a dish. Monsieur was called the, the Pope of aligo. And it looks like mashed potatoes, but it has a consistency of bubble gum. I'm not exaggerating. So to make aligo, you puree uh, potatoes and creme fraiche, and then you add an unaged cheese, a tome. And you stir until the mixture becomes a thick paste so that when you serve it, you have to give the spoon a real shake, like, in, like, in the, like that. And then the aligo lands on your plate with a thud. But the key to a really good aligo is its stretchy consistency. So to test to see if the aligo is ready, you say, on va filer l'aligo, we're going to stretch it, like taffy. And when I was in the Aubrac, I was lucky enough to watch Monsieur and his sons make aligo. So they boiled an enormous pot of potatoes. And when they were soft, Monsieur Valédier and his sons, they took turns stirring the mixture with a large spoon. The spoon was about the size of an oar. Um, and they worked their arms. They blended this big mass of potatoes and cheese. And they stirred for what felt like half an hour. And then it was time for Monsieur to do the honors of checking to make sure the aligo was ready. So Monsieur Valadier, he dipped the oar into the pot and he started to lift his arm. And I should note that Monsieur Valadier is six feet tall, so that's a lot taller than me. And the, the pot was on the floor. So he lifted his arm and he stretched and he stretched and he stretched until the string reached from the oar all the way to the pot. The string didn't break. The aligo was perfect. So when this official called Monsieur the Pope of Aligo, it was fitting because this sturdy thread is a metaphor for the thread that offers the Aubrac its resiliency, tying the community together and to the natural world, strengthening the economy. The Aligo is a metaphor for innovation. So wherever we live, we can all find our own version of Aligo, something that ties us together with, e with each other, with the natural world, with our food, to help support a more sustainable way. Thank you.